Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Queensland Performing Arts Centre. My name is Rebecca Lemoyne. I'm the Director of Public Engagement. And on behalf of all of my colleagues here at QPAC, but particularly on behalf of our special guests from Milan, the La Scala Ballet Company, thank you for being here with us for Talking Italian. We do a bunch of these kind of conversations in this Cremorne Theatre all year, but of course we're not the first ones to do so. For thousands of years, uh, conversations and stories and cultural practice has been taking place here. So I would acknowledge the Yagara and Turubal people, the traditional custodians of this part of Brisbane where QPAC stands. Uh, this conversation series is one of eight different uh, programs and projects that we have produced to sit around the, this season of La Scala. And our intention is always to kind of scratch a little bit below the surface to learn a little bit more about the uh, history and the impact of Italian culture here in Australia, about the company that's visiting us and what an amazing history this company has for us to learn about, but also to look at some of the ideas and the themes that are underpinning the two productions. And so, of course, Tonight we'll be doing that in relation to Don Quixote. Can I introduce you to my esteemed colleague, Professor Judith McLean, who's going to lead the conversation tonight. Hello, everyone. Judith is QPAC Scholar in Residence and she is also a Chair in Arts Education, which is a joint appointment between QPAC and QUT. Uh, in addition to being a scholar, she is also a writer and a teaching artist. She has a very good eye to, for spotting an interesting person and an interesting story, so no doubt you're in for a treat. So again, please welcome our panel and have a wonderful conversation. Thank you, and good evening to you all and welcome. As um, Rebecca said, it's great that you came. Can I get an indication, excuse me for doing this, just who saw uh, the ballet this afternoon? Great, and who's to see it tonight? Wow, are you in for a treat? Um, okay, well, hopefully um, these conversations are um, meant to help you go deeper and to give you even more enjoyment than you get from just being in the theatre. And to do that, we have uh, two very eminent people here uh, tonight. Um, many of you will have seen in the program, and I'm going to plug the program because it's an incredible document, and it, again, will give you an even deeper understanding of what's on. Maestro Frederic Oliveri is ballet director of La Scala. You've been associated, I think, since the early 90s with La Scala, yeah. but your job as ballet director has been since 2005, is that right? And you are not only director of the ballet, you're also director of the ballet school. Yeah. And I heard um, in interview with you on Thursday afternoon that about 70% of the dancers for the company come from the school. Yeah, so exactly. even more. Even yeah. more. It's work, yeah, it's work. Yeah, even so more. that's an enormous responsibility. Yeah. Um, in 2005, you were um, awarded the Knight of Arts and Letters by the French government. You are, in fact, French, is yeah, that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I don't put the medal. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, a title, yeah. I thought, that indicates your knowledge of chivalry and gallantry, much like the hero of the eponymous piece, Don Quixote, um, albeit, albeit, I felt, with more rationality, <laughs> I hope, at the ballet, and with more talent. Um, his CV is on page 68 of the program, and it really is an incredible career. Please make him feel very welcome. Uh, Dr. Danielle Valunas uh, has taught at both secondary and postgraduate levels, not only in uh, medicine, but in the arts, in science, and environmental and psychological medicine. Uh, last century, she has a uh, great joy in telling me, she was the T, and that's not so long ago, she was the TV doctor and the radio doctor. Her work in indigenous and transcultural medicine, psychiatry, specialist psychotherapy and medical ethics uh, is well known. Uh, she's an incredible mind and you'll hear that in conversation with her tonight. She currently works in clinical practice and I know by the end of tonight you'll be lining up to say, <laughs> when can I come and see you? Please welcome Danielle. Um, we're going to start with you, Frederic. Um, 
how has Brisbane been for you and the company? This is the first time that uh, La Scala has ever been to Australia. Yeah, absolutely. And you're only coming to Brisbane. Yeah, absolutely. Have we have we done ourselves well? Proud? Yeah, yeah. Very. We feel very, very, very well here. It's a wonderful city. A very fantastic way of life. And I think everything is made is made for to make the the people here live in the the best way. So uh, we immediately feel yes. that. So yeah. in, in every in every way, culture, uh, organization, uh, structure of the city, and everything. So I can appreciate that. The company is very happy to be there. That's wonderful. Even we, we work a lot because we have two programs and uh, and many casts. So <laughs> we're, we're always we're working hard. one day rest in yeah. uh, in twenty days. But uh, we were in an island to yes. see the company. Yes. Or the, or the group. But we're very happy to be there. Um, as I came in yeah. tonight and I walked in through the green room, uh, the afternoon show, uh, there were still fans outside and uh, yeah. taking photographs and there was no, no, a, nice. such an energy and Absolute. such a buzz. Yes. Absolutely. No, no, we, well, we feel it. We feel it. The public, I must say, the, the audience is fantastic. That's fantastic. Really fantastic. Great. Well, I'm, I'm so pleased and we've felt so that. Bravo, bravo to you. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, I, w I want to start by referring to the program. And in the program, one of the introductory essays says this, that a great company is distinguished by the care and attention it devotes to young talents and by its ability to project itself towards ballet that reflects our time. So there are two questions there. The first is care of dancers and the second is making ballet that still speaks to people. Would you like yeah. to talk about that? Yeah, for me, uh, <coughs> as a director of the school, and um, I really care about the, the, my student. If we take the, because uh, it's a long process, because has, I have some dancers in the company. They start at uh, six years, years old in, uh, in the school. Mm -hmm. Because the five first year, they are six to ten, it's, it's quite just... Uh, coordination, musicality, movement, sp space. It's not so uh, really formation school. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's some dancers, they, they know me, me from six years old until uh, 24, 25 years. So they, it's a big responsibility. So I have made some uh, meeting with, uh, even for a, a s soccer team mm -hmm. in Italy, Inter, Inter is a very famous uh, so team. Okay. They asked me to go and to say how you can uh, manage the, the talent. And uh, that is very difficult because uh, you must be very um, aware and very attent, not to push too much, mm -hmm. attent not too close too much, mm -hmm. uh, to give some uh, discipline, to give some formation, very precise, but uh, with keep keeping the op open to the character, to the way that the student see the, the life, see the way to dance, mm -hmm. uh, and the artistic way to the same. So it's a big responsibility. So for the, the dancer, um, we are always very uh, take care about to, to make them grow in a, in not in a very fast way. Cause I it's always be before to, to wait uh, one year before to do some other thing and do in one year in a very good way. Yes, no. I, and I know there was a question <coughs> on Thursday night from one of the audience about uh, many of the dancers don't want to admit that they have an injury yeah. um, because they don't, you know, a bit like mm. footballers never want to come off the field, dancers don't want to go off the yeah. stage. How yeah. have you got around that? Yeah, that could be a problem. I, I remember that when we dance, we are the dancer, uh, I think uh, we can support uh, the pain. We can support uh, many, uh, can deal with yeah, them. because we are so involved. Uh, so I don't know by magic or something special inside. So surely she can. Yeah, she'll <laughs> tell you what it is. Yes. Happen that we forget. We don't feel after when the clothes, the curtain close. Ah, <laughs> we cannot in, in even yeah. walk. Yeah. But the student, we need that they need to learn that if they have a problem, they need to talk. They need to stop. They need to to speak with the doctor, yes. to see the director or the, ballet or the, or the teacher, absolutely. Mm. That's education. So after in the company, it's always um, a balance, the right balance between, uh, because uh, sometimes someone he has uh, just a little, uh, little pain, so it's, it's my responsibility to see how he, I'm sure he can dance or she yes. can dance. Yes. So it just, but in when it's a big uh, problem, you need to stop immediately. Yes. So that's not a right. discussion. A and 
Um, the, thank you. So that's a great answer. And, and we might come to the question of relevancy a little later and the relevancy of the ballet. So let's get down to the ballet. And tonight we're discussing um, uh, what madness is this. And so we're going to really try and focus on uh, the madness of the piece. Um, Danielle, um, the title, Don Quixote, uh, I think most people will know what it means. Have you ever met a truly quixotic person? Oh. Um, as a psychiatrist? <laughs> um, as a psychiatrist, probably all the time, because, <laughs> because that sense that we carry inside us of our own dreams, our own ideals, um, what's possible, unless, of course, it's been crushed out of us, in which case we'll present to a psychiatrist in another way. But we have the best of the quixotic endeavour inside us, sometimes completely unexpressed, except through reading fiction, through reading poetry, through coming to theatre. Um, so, given that that's in all of us, why wouldn't it be in people who find themselves in a sticky spot and who'll come and say, let's talk this through? Um, but the thing about the word quixotic is that it usually means unreal and ungrounded. Um, now, that's uh, an interesting conundrum that's offered right there, because who is to say what's real? And is that not a matter of this much vaunted free will that we're supposed to have? Who decides what is the more real? The truths of the inner world or the somewhat manipulated and manipulable truths of the outer world as they are presented to us by people who are not short of an agenda which may or may not be hidden. Mm. So um, with Don Quixote, He's often, uh, I've read that he's perhaps the sanest madman in all literary fiction. Um, and, I mean, I know you've read the whole volume, which was a mighty effort. It's, you know, it's 500 pages. Um, where did you come to, having read not just the first act, which we see in the ballet, but the whole book? Where did you come to? Oh, it's, there's no doubt he's mad. And the reason that I say that is because his servants tell us. And the narrator tells us whether the author thinks he's mad or not is another matter. I think it's... May I speak a little to Please. Cervantes? Because he wrote it late. Um, there's some argument among the, uh, the toffs um, in academia as to whether he intended to write a great work or whether, like Shakespeare, he was simply earning a living. His household was growing... Um, he had people to support. He hadn't done well as a provider. He'd written 20 to 30 plays, which had not been put on. His first love was poetry. He won a couple of minor prizes, but made no money. No surprises there. Uh, he had a publisher who was very careless with the original edition. And so he sat down to write a story and the proposition is that, like Shakespeare, who was obvious at the same time, um, that he wrote in order to make a living, as, for example, uh, Kerry Greenwood, who wrote the Phryne Fisher Mysteries, did. She wrote a story, entered it into the Vogel, it didn't win, but one of the publishers said, we need more crime, write us a crime story. And that's how a greatly successful internationally set of series of books and, um, and TV series came to be born. Um, so Cervantes was writing to amuse, and he succeeded. It was incredibly popular right from the beginning. Mm. In fact, um, and it's funny, it's fast. It, it reminded me of Gilbert and Sullivan. Take a perfectly ridiculous subject and treat it with the utmost seriousness, and you've got Don Quixote. But everybody knows that he's mad. And yet, in the episodic stories that you get in Don Quixote, he takes some actions, most of which are catastrophic for the people he's supposed to be saving, but some of which are brilliant. 
it's interesting not to romanticize him and see him as a hero of a classic hero's journey story because he goes in search of gratification, of narcissistic uh, inflation. He wants to be recognized and he's going out for money. So he's appropriating the chivalric code, saying, let's make this real. I will find damsels to rescue. Um, I'll invent a heroine from the tavern wench. I'll turn her into, you know, a princess figure. Uh, and she'll be so pleased with me, she'll marry me and um, confer her kingdom on me and I'll have lots of money and enough um, to give my friend Sancho an island. I, I thought it was interesting that he was thrown in jail, Cervantes, Absolutely. for being a failed tax collector. Absolutely. <laughs> he was no stranger to reality. No. So he creates a hero who creates his own reality. Yes whom everybody who sees him is mad. Yes. However, it's very subversive. Yeah. because it's, it's a time that's very racist. So there are references to the true Christians. That's code for no Jewish blood. Mm. There are references to Moors, to the Islamic world, with great disapproval. Um, so people who have Moorish names are as good and kind and generous as if they might be Christian. Mm. Um, so and, and the book burning in, in the prologue is the example of that, isn't is, it? Is a yeah. reference to that with yeah. which the ballet starts. Yes. Um, but it's, um, I found it a sort of... The, the great novels are great because they reference things in the outer world, but they point into an inner world truth. Great. So... So the book burning references to, um, as I think you've articulated, that the uh, romantics were on the move, the church disapproved. Cervantes was a very devout Catholic. He's been called part of the counter-reformation movement. Um, it's been observed that the reformation in Spain and the counter-reformation had a different flavour from what was the case in France and in Italy. Um, so that was the author, um, but in the actual way that his servants and his family deal with his emerging madness, his dereliction of duty, his complete preoccupation with these stories and living as if the stories are true and that he's going to live them out, they try a basic behaviourist psychotherapy approach. They'll change the outer environment. So they start burning the books echoing, therefore, the burning um, of the romantic books, at least the church's disapproval, and foreshadowing, of course, Kristallnacht, um, the terrible destruction and burning of a whole culture to try and destroy the books. But, of course, the ideas take hold, um, and it doesn't work. But later on, there's another story where, um, in part two, written ten years later, He's recovered, he's found his sanity, and the women, um, he's neither fallen into the hands of the police nor the doctors, it's not entirely clear which would be a worse fate, um, but he's fallen back into the hands of his family who care for him. They love him, they feed him, they water him, they support him, and he recovers his mind. And that's measured by his ability to talk about the philosophy and politics of the day. Everyone doesn't, the, the men don't believe it, they are much astonished. The women say, be careful, he's fragile. But one of his friends uh, decides that he'll test him and introduces, against the advice of the women, introduces the concept of politics. And he's offered away back into the chivalric world. All the king needs is knight errantry and he's the knight to uh, sort the problems of state. So the madness returns. So the madness returns and the burning of the books. Um, and you made a lovely point in the green room saying that it was interesting that as they burned the books, there's such humour because they're going through his books and saying, oh, that's quite interesting, I think I might keep that one. <laughs> so it raises the whole question of what happens to the people who are the censors and the hypocrisy um, and the social politics at play as you decide who's, it's control, who actually can withstand the influence of these books and who may not. But of course, the person who's imposing the control always attributes 
um, like Don Quixote, that I am superior. Yes. So and the and narcissism is the narcissism is spread around, yes. and the goodness is also spread around because in the cruelty to him, many of the um, the aristocracy, the toffs, are cruel to him for their own amusement, while the lonely, the servants, the Jews, the Moors, those who are suspected of being such, they are kind. Mm. So where's the craziness reside yes. and where is the sanity? Is it in goodness or is it on in that which is socially approved? Yes, thank you. Um, Frederick, um, I'm, I'm going to um, turn back to the production <coughs> and we'll do this, we'll content and then production. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nureyev version um, uh, has been in part of the company repertoire now, I yes. think, for a long time. Um, and I know you talked about... Um, uh, the choreologist comes along and actually gets it up and, mm -hmm. and people from the foundation come and say, yes, that's okay, you can go on with it. Um, yep. What is it about the Nureyev production that is so important? I think in this version of Don Quixote of Nureyev, it's, it means that we have uh, in a uh, second view, we can say, or what uh, the professors say, just now, yeah. the man of Don Quixote. In the prologue at the beginning, he, he, um, the, uh, Don Quixote is a pretext to, to make a very beautiful ballet, mm. very uh, in uh, many styles. We can have in a third mm. act, we can have uh, many different styles of uh, dancing. Yes. But in the, f uh, the fond around, there's always Don Quixote, the story of Don Quixote. And the prologue he, ma he made in uh, seven minutes all the just to make understand how the ballet start, and after after it's just around the story of love. But it's, a, it's very intelligent. I think this version is right because there's always Don Quixote and Sancho, and the idea of this madness, of this vision, of this uh, genius exaggeration to to want to go against the the bad, the yes. bad to, to, and, to sort and the to world go out. and to save the people. Yes. But he's always there at the moment that the story could become a simple between a sto love story with, ba with uh, Kitri and Basilio, arrive Don Quixote and give again a new, uh, a new blood, we can say, in, in this any, uh, many scene. Mm. So it's very important. We, the structure is, very, is made really in a perfect way for me. And it's for that this version is very uh, uh, perfect for us. Yes. Because uh, even at the second night where, the, where uh, there's, uh, he go against uh, Moulin, avant, and uh, how do you say Moulin avant? Wind, uh, he go again. At uh, the windmills? Yeah. And after immediately, uh, his mind, he, he, he sees a vision, uh, the, the research the of giant? the Dulcinea, mm. and there's uh, the pretext to make a very uh, classical and... Mm. Uh, uh, romantic and classical part with mm. Driadi, mm. who is made for the for the girls very special work mm. and very difficult. It's not just dancing. Uh, it's okay. The first act, it, it must be there. Are some rules. There must be in line. There must be music. But uh, Driadi in the tutu, short tutu, and the legs must be the line must be the music. <laughs> so it's a, a moment very special. Yes. And after in the third act, after the big part of the, you return in the fandango traditional dance. Spanish dance, and that is made that this, this version is for me to for me the best. The yes. This is not boring for nothing because the many versions are really uh, long, but that is, is uh, so for that we have in the repertoire. It will stay in the repertoire. Um, the, the comments that I hear about your company, and as you know, we've been lucky enough to have the international series, and you know the companies mm. that we've had over the last nine years. And one of the questions we always ask is. What is, uniquely, uh, what is unique about La Scala Ballet, about the style? And I feel like uh, after watching the performances now, it's both mm. with your company, if I might be bold, mm. it's both the precision of the technique and the romanticism of the company. Would you... Yeah, I think for me, yes. But I think many companies have this uh, quality. It must be a big company, must be a this. Mm -hmm. But I think what we have is the corps de ballet, from the last of the corps de ballet. Yes. Even there's not the last corps de ballet. There's the corps de ballet, solist, principal dancer, etoile. There's a very high quality. Yes. And very, uh, they are involved in 100%. In uh, even the last, I always 
watch in the, when I went in the audience, not the first line, always the back line. Always yes. to see if they and they are always these companies are involved. Yes. They were in, 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 on stage during the performance, on stage during the rehearsal, and the class. Yes. So it's very for me it's very rare. So yes. that makes the, the strongest uh, of the company. Yes, beautiful. They are, we have I have a very good team with uh, two fantastic ballet master, and so that's two. It's very important. All everything works uh, around, but uh, the dancer, I think there's uh, the joy. The, I mean the joy to dance. They are happy to dance to be on stage, and uh, after 30 years of career, they still uh, want to dance on yes. stage, so that is really important to know. There are some dancers who are 40 years old, yes. and they are really, uh, really happy, enjoy to be on stage, yes. and proud to be on stage, yes. that is uh, rare. Uh, um, I know that um, we saw Wolfworks here yeah. last year, mm. those of you who saw it, and I know it's coming to you, yes. you're going to take it, and yes. I would be fascinated to <laughs> yeah, see Wayne <laughs> McGregor working on your dances. It no, will no, be absolutely, I'm very happy about this, to have this production be very uh, exciting. in April, because uh, it will be a uh, yeah, highlight of our season. Just before we have a creation of Angers Préjocage, that is very important yes. for us. Yes, well, he's a wonderful... Of winter eyes. And right after, we have, uh, we have these two special moments of contemporary. contemporary. It's, uh, it's very important for the I, company. Is that difficult for the, for the dancers? Is that a... It's just, uh, it must be a right balance. That uh, the, the season must be in a made in a way that uh, the dancer could do everything in the best uh, and prepare in the best way. Yes. Sometimes it's not really possible because uh, we have many to do, but uh, I try to do the best for that. For example, now this, this beginning of season was, was quite uh, uh, heavy for the company because we arrive after one week, uh, after holidays, we arrive after one week of work, we go one month in China, which is at Don Quixote, we return after one week, we are seven performance from Manon, Macmillan, and after we finish the, the 12, it was the last performance, and, uh, and we, we, we immediately after, we, we take the plane the day after to come here. And after we come back, we have a new nutcracker and the creation. But that's a normal way, but it's quite... Uh, it's grueling, isn't it? it it's yeah, uh, really... Absolutely. It must be like a company for me. Yes. It must be this kind of... Uh, never the stop. adrenaline. Never stop. <laughs> but at the moment, they need to rest. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Danielle, back to you. Um, um, Cervantes certainly knew a bit about psycholo psychology. Would you agree with that? Oh, he was great. Yeah. He was... And that's Great. 400 years old. So um, uh, I wonder if you think it's still relevant then for the people that you see in your practice, you know, uh, is there a relevance in his work and in the ballet? Oh, I think the, um, the, the story's relevant. <clears throat> He's uh, a master of demonstrating projection, which is a... What is know, that? Which is that that mechanism by which we attribute to others um, that which is within ourselves, and especially we're likely to attribute that which we can't quite handle in ourselves, so either that which is forbidden or is uncomfortable, we attribute to the other, especially to the stranger, and then we attack. Um, so this happens in families, it happens in societies, it happens in nations. Um, but the relevance is... Uh, the relevance is, for example, in the Me Too movement. So we've referred to... May I, may I read yes, something? It's do. not just the, the sentiments that are relevant, but the language. Um, so obviously we're reading in uh, English translation. But the translation is very flowery. It, you sort of think, oh, well, it's written 400 years ago. Of course it's going to be flowery and it's chivalric and it's nonsense. But then you get a speech. Now, this comes very early. So the setup is that there's a maid. This is called a pastoral interlude. There's a maid, she's extraordinarily beautiful, she has many swains, one of them's in love with her, um, the love is not requited, so blah de blah he ends up killing himself. Much with the drama, there's a funeral, uh, breast beating, what a cow she is, quite literally, beast names are used, is this sounding familiar? And lo and behold, she appears, and she's real. She's not Dulcinea, you know, the sweet one. Her name is Marcella. Um, she appears, and she's immediately reproached by the, uh, again, the pairing, the best friend, Ambrosio, 
Um, and he says, what are you doing here? If you come here to mock you cruel, heartless, um, sort of beast of a woman. And she'll have none of it. So if I may, she says, I do not come for any of the reasons you've mentioned, replied Marcella. I come to defend myself and to demonstrate how unreasonable all these persons are who blame me for their sufferings and for Grisostomo's death. I therefore ask all here present to hear me attentively. So there was a professor of psychology quite recently at a confirmation hearing who asked to be listened to attentively. Um, so here she goes. Heaven made me beautiful, you say, so beautiful that you are compelled to love me, whether you will or no. And in return for the love that you show me, you would have it that I'm obliged to love you in return. I know with that natural understanding that God has given me, note the clarion call from the woman, I have my own mind. She's no, you know, piece of fluff. I know that everything beautiful is lovable, but I cannot see that it follows that the object that is loved for its beauty must love the one who loves it. Let us suppose that the lover of the beautiful was ugly, and being ugly, deserved to be shunned. It would then be highly absurd for him to say, I love you because you're beautiful, you must love me because I'm ugly. So note the quality of the philosophy and the thought. This is straight out of a philosophy one session. Um, and she goes on. But assuming that two individuals are equally beautiful, it does not mean that their desires are the same. For not all beauty inspires love, but may sometimes merely delight the eye and leave the will intact. If it were otherwise, no one would know what he wanted. But all would wander, vaguely, aimlessly, with nothing upon which to settle their affections. For the number of beautiful objects being infinite, think of our world here, desires similarly would be boundless. I've heard it said that true love knows division and must be voluntary and not forced. That being so, as I believe it is, then why would you compel me to surrender my will for no other reason than that you say you love me? But tell me, supposing that heaven which made me beautiful had made me ugly instead, should I have any right to complain because you did not love me? And you must remember, moreover, that I did not choose this beauty that is mine, such as it is. Heaven gave it me of its grace, without any choice or asking on my part. As the viper is not to be blamed for the deadly poison that it bears, since that is a gift of nature, so I do not deserve to be reprehended. And then she uses an amazing metaphor comparing the beauty in a woman to a distant fire or a sharp-edged sword. And she makes the point that neither the fire nor the sword can hurt you unless you get close to it. So she says, if you don't want to be hurt, stay away. Um, and then something very interestingly interesting happens. Um, she says of, um, of the dead man, had I led him on, it would have been falsely. Had I gratified his passion, it would have been against my own judgment and intentions. But I disillusioned him, yet he persisted. And though I did not hate him, he was driven to despair. And then she goes on to say, the thing that killed him was his impatience and the impetuosity of his desire. So why blame my modest conduct and retiring life. There's projection. <laughs> yeah. So completely articulated in the words of someone who could be writing a response on the net today. For the, for the Me Too movement. For the Me Too movement. To explain. We, sh we need to put it into boys' schools to explain. Absolutely. Yeah. But if I could make one more point here, yeah. something very interesting happens immediately afterwards to go to the point of is Don Quixote mad mm. and what's madness. So she says what she's got to say. It's only four pages. It's beautiful writing. And she goes. 
And the swains swoon, so they haven't gotten any of it. They, they love, now they're not only enchanted by her beauty, but also <laughs> by her wit. Um, and some want to go after her. And something, so they haven't got it. She's saying, bugger off, leave me alone, in rather more highfalutin language, but not very. And Don Quixote then stirs himself. He notices this ripple of, oh, we must go after her, even though she's impassionately asked to be left alone. And Don Quixote, seeing this and thinking to himself that here was an opportunity to display his chivalry by succoring a damsel in distress and thereby earning more credit with Dulcinea. So he's mad as a meat axe, but strategic, focused, purposeful. And you sort of think, oh my goodness, who's the fool here? And sort of goes in and stops them from following her. There's the wise, the wise fool, the wise man. Well, cunning at least. Yes. Um, interesting, um, Frederick. I ran into uh, my ex, my former vice chancellor, who had seen Don Quixote, mm -hmm. and he. I said, "Did you enjoy it?" And he said, "I loved it." He said, "When Don Quixote was sitting over in the corner, Andy, it can you jump on comms for a sec? All of those old academics." <laughs> <laughs> Like uh, and I, I thought <laughs> all those professors who should I be... He's very good, very good uh, interpreter. Yes. Joseph. And his name is Giuseppe Conte. It's like the same name of our new prime minister, uh -huh. prime minister in, uh, yes. in Italy. So it's a big responsibility. The characterization, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so so I, I was going to ask you a question. Um, in the ballet, do you think we laugh at him or with him? Do you think we laugh it at Don Quixote? When he charges against the no, I think we, we laugh to the situation. The situation, because it made to... Uh, it made even the dancer were around, even all the zing zikan, when they say, welcome, and the, in the first act, all the, the dancer were um, on stage to make welcome. They, they laugh of, of him. They laugh of, of him. But uh, the public no laugh about the, the, the situation, because uh, it's so original, the way that... Uh, he, he, he brings uh, to the, the moment, the right moment, uh, Rudolf, uh, that um, it's, it's perfectly. But on stage, the, the, the scene, all the dancers, first, second, and third act, the dancers, the people who are around him, they, they laugh of him inside. This is the exaggerate of the movement, and yes. the, there's dance, this menuet dance. So it's a moment of uh, spi spirit, uh, very special and uh, humoristic. Yes. But uh, what is difficult in this situation that um, when we're on in the studio to work with special works, like Don Quixote or Sancho Panza or Gamache, uh, is they, they need to be controlled. To be, to be not, not too much. Not too big. It's not. It's enough. The yes. choreography, the music, yes. Yes. the the way the mise en scène is enough. Yes. Otherwise, so they become buffoons. Yeah, and yes. it's not. Uh, it's not good. Yes. But it's, it's a work. So I, I have a question though, because this panel is called "What Madness Is This?" Who is the maddest? Don Quixote, the father, the lovers, Gamache, the rich man. Yeah. There's plenty of madness yeah. going on. I think they're all mad. <laughs> <laughs> they're all so mad. It's a different level, I think. Yeah. <laughs> different level, yes. uh, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> um, Danielle, um, yeah. when we were speaking, you said to me uh, that as preparation for your psychiatry exams, there's a particular question. Would you like to tell us what that is? I'd love to. So the, the question that we were asked as a curved ball, um, not to give necessarily the right answer, although there is a right answer, but to see how we approached it. The question was, what is the difference between a single symptom delusional psychosis and the state of being in love? <laughs> and the answer, of course, is nothing. <laughs> Except for social sanction. Um, which... Uh, which is interesting in the ballet, because the romantic movement would say, of course, it's the lovers, and love needs to be spontaneous, um, and the father, who doesn't care, um, presumably, about his daughter's heart, but does care about her physical comfort, who wants her to be with a rich man, mm. the buffoon rich man, 
um, a critique of the rich from the poor writer um, who wants her for her beauty, so the father commodifies love for money. The rich man commodifies uh, the woman's beauty, again, um, for the sake of, presumably, of his status. Um, the lovers don't know each other. This, is, this pairing is highly likely not to end well, uh, unless they've both got very large groups of friends. Um, so there's plenty of madness, as you say, to go round. I, I, I applaud your diagnostic <coughs> accuracy. Um, and, um, but it, it raises some enchanting and delightful questions. Yes. Hmm. Um, uh, Frederick, many may say that bringing a company 16,429 kilometres might well be called a madness. Um, can you talk <laughs> about bringing a company of 109 yeah. people? Yeah. Is that right, Janelle? Janelle Christophers, the executive <laughs> producer, yeah. is in the audience. Um, 109 no, it's people it's <laughs> from... It's all a question of organi organisation and, and, uh, and time and schedule. Yes. If we work a long time before, yes. everything is quite simple. Yes. And when we have some, uh, the last minute, some organisation is always... Uh, we, miss, we forget always something, I'm mm. sure. Yes. So it's just to always the set and the costume, they need to... Um, to leave uh, from Milan. In, in this situation, they, they come from China because they, we were in China, so they come direct China from here. Yes. And uh, and for the preparation, it's uh, for the ballet. We just need to organize because we have the performance Giselle and Don Quixote on tour. But as I say, we have, we have Manon, we have Don Quixote, we have a Nutcracker, mm. we have this creation. So it's just uh, we need to have a right equilibrium mm. of all this. And I guess and trust uh, as well between. The host organization <coughs> and. We and need to trust. Yeah, the yeah. trust is it's essential. So yeah. it's nothing yeah. works. No. And that's another part. There's every uh, responsible in each, uh, in each yes. department who have the. Uh, for the contract, for the sets, for the costume, for, yes. the, for, the, for the ballet, for a, the, a lot for can the go travel. Wrong. And uh, it's. But it's nice. I, I think for me, I come from. I have this experience of free. Uh, as a dancer for free company different and uh, it's it's helped me always uh, as director because I, I, I born in uh, in Paris Opera was a state theater so it's really less rules like Scala there's some rules and some very precise schedule uh, mm -hmm. very precise uh, yeah there's some rules very that you are like, you, you direct the company that you know where you are and after I was uh, for 10 years in Monte Carlo Ballet where a private company but we do a lot so it was uh, the most we go in all the world, it was uh, the, 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 the best way. Yes. And after I finished my career with uh, John Nomaya's choreographer, a choreographer company. Yes. So I have this free example, who, the mixed. So I t my direction is always in this, the idea of mixing the, the, the way uh, of, uh, an artistic way and in the way of di direct uh, a, a group in, with the mix of this free experience. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's, uh, for me, I think it's the best. Yes, way. and keeps it fresh and vital and... Yeah, because you cannot do on, only two, but, you, but we need rules, but we need choreographer, but we, we need to have a good mix, so yes. that I think it's uh, the best way. Good, excellent. Mm. And the last question for you before I open it up to the audience for some questions, Danielle, is um, you would say that Don Quixote continues to make pretty bad choices. So to what extent are we responsible and can we bear the consequences, and should we bear the consequences of repeatedly uh, bad decisions, badly made decisions, even if we are not in our right mind? Well, who's to say? Um, and in, in medicine, which is sort of tries to use science in the service of ameliorating suffering caused by disease, um, there's this, in psychiatry, there's this difficulty of the suffering that's caused by personality habit, that someone who repeatedly, who is shy, repeatedly doesn't um, make an effort to overcome the shyness, whether that's because of lack of opportunity or lack of assistance or lack of inclination or resistance when all of those are present, becomes more and more withdrawn 
and eventually the inner world becomes more real than the outer world. Now, Don Quixote was approaching 50, so 49, midlife crisis, and in a numerologically sensitive world, seven times seven. That's interesting in itself. But, so he withdraws, goes mad, becomes obsessive and preoccupied, but um, his dereliction of duty as prescribed both by himself and natural human affection and by the tribe, um, is, that, is that the disease? Is that an affliction? Is it genetics? Or is it choice? And so the consequence of his choice is that he starts to inflict great pain and great suffering. So the people who love him say, well, he needs help, the doctor or, the pol or locking up or the policeman. Um, we would say um, that people need help, but we have a dialogue going on right now where we have a minister for Homeland Security saying uh, it's just an excuse, this mental illness story. Subsequently, he said, not that I don't think it's important, but it's an excuse. Um, and I don't care. It's because uh, these are the religious views and it's the choices and it doesn't matter about the mental health or the disease status. Um, so who's to say when the people who do say, uh, the so-called specialists, ours is an era of specialisation, so you get a whole team of sociologists and psychologists and psychiatrists saying this is cruel and inhumane treatment to keep children and women locked up um, on islands uh, without opportunity uh, when they have committed no crime um, other than to seek asylum, um, separating families at a border um, for the sake of politics. But there are people who are saying that that is fine. So whose choice is it and who is to pay for the consequences of those choices? Do you say that they're internal choices or do you say that they're the choices of other people? Um, these are questions uh, that require um, exploration as a community yes. rather than a pronouncement, yes. whether on high from a politician or from an expert. Yes. Uh, because the expertise also lies in the room, mm. in this room, and mm. rooms like it. Yes. Thank you for raising that, Danielle. It's my job yeah. to finish on time. Would you please thank our very eminent guests? <laughs>